I don't really know how to start this video or even what it's going to be about, but I watched Ruby and uh, I want to talk about it. I don't even know why I decided to do this. Um, it's not like I ever cared about Ruby. All I knew about it was that it was some 3D animated web series with anime girls in it. I just decided to watch on a whim and bro, it was like a meth addict getting his first hit, uh, like, like a chain smoker taking his first puff. Like it was like a lollicon watching his first episode of Monogatari. I, it was the first sweet taste that sent me spiraling down the ruby rabbit hole. Naturally, afterwards, I just had to look into the fandom to see what kind of discussions people were having about the show, especially considering Volume 9 is about to be released. And to my surprise, I walked into a fandom that was more chaotic and divided than the American political landscape. It was like, it was like East Germany and West Germany. I felt like Troy in that one episode of Community. <laughs> Because again, mind you, I knew nothing about Ruby before before this. I had no idea there was such a large segment of the fan base that absolutely hated the show and what it's become in their words, I guess. But anyway, at that point, I was hooked. I had to dive deeper to find out exactly why the Ruby fandom is the way it is and how the show came to be what it is today. It was my mission, you could say, as someone who obsesses over behind the scenes shit like this. And I guess, you know, I figured it'd be interesting if you're a longtime Ruby fan watching this to see the perspective of a Ruby virgin who just got his cherry popped. I got absolutely no connection to the series. I didn't follow it from its conception. I don't know anything about red versus blue. None of that. It's it's just a show I decided to start watching like a week ago. So from that perspective, I think it's really interesting to take a look at the series as a whole and see the nightmare it's become from the outside looking in. So I guess that's what this video is going to be. So buckle in y'all. We about to, we about to dive deep into the enigma that's Ruby. I'm I'm sorry, I don't know what this is. I don't know why I had to spread it like that. I'm sorry y'all to see that. Okay, so I guess for the first part of the video, I can just recount my experience watching the show because I recorded uh, the whole thing or most of it. So y'all can see footage of a man who has been drawn into the ruby void. So you're going to hear me say some shit that makes it seem like I'm unaware of what's going on um, in the show. But I promise watch till the second half of the video because I educate myself after. That's when we can dive into the nitty gritty behind the scenes stuff, which is the real shit you should stick around for. So um, uh, leave a like, subscribe and, uh, you know, all that donate donate to patreon if you want to support the channel but anyway ruby right if you follow me on twitter you know that i tweeted out the night i started watching the show and my first impressions were mixed at best again i knew it was 3d animated but i didn't know how uh homemade it felt let me give you all the premise of the show real quick ruby is about a world where huntsmen and huntresses work to protect humanity from creatures called grim the story follows the four main characters ruby rose weiss Schnee, blake belladonna and yang Zhao long as they arrive to train at beacon academy to become huntresses shenanigans ensue looking back at volume one you can tell that this is really everything that felt like Ruby. You know, the, the low budget janky 3D models had a, had a certain charm to them. The music was kick ass, all the characters had witty one liners for days, and of course, the action choreography was on point. Thing is, if you watch this channel, you know I don't give a fuck about watching no action scenes in animation at least. That kind of thing only hits for me in live action because of the difficulty of the execution, and yet even my boomer ass could sit there and appreciate the fight choreography in Ruby. Oh my god, this looks terrible. I love it. Jesus, ain't this supposed to be a kid's show? Actually, I don't even know if that's true. I just assumed that since it looks like fucking Code Lyoko, they wouldn't have a decapitated snake, but hey. Why was that so good, though? I could visualize the button prompts for the quick time events that whole time. To me, watching this volume was like watching an extended cutscene from a PS2 game, but like, like a really good one. Looking back, it's strange to know now that this is the volume that got millions hooked and, and kickstarted this whole franchise because as I was watching, all I saw was just a novelty. And you know, granted, you could argue that that's the point and that it was never meant to be that serious, but we'll get into that later. The main plot points of the first two volumes revolve around the exploits of Team Ruby and also their buddies in Team Juniper as they go through training, deal with teenage drama, 
get involved in political subterfuge, and uncover anti-establishment conspiracies, all set to what sounds like songs from the playlist of a 14-year-old Green Day fan. And not 90s Green Day, 21st century breakdown Green Day. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy these first few volumes, and I could definitely see the appeal. You just can't help but be enchanted by the effort, love, and care put into the characters, and of course the fight scenes. The voice acting is relatively amateur, but full of spirit. The writing is a little goofy, but still well put together with a mostly airtight script, and all the action really feels like every single move is thought out and purposeful. Even as I was watching for the first time, I could see the that Hong Kong cinema influence, especially since I'm a big Jackie Chan fan. You could definitely see his style of fight choreography in these early, se uh, early seasons and even onwards. But that action isn't really what kept me watching. For me, it was the waifus. For me, it was the characters and dialogue. I don't care, I'm a sucker for the goofy Disney Marvel style dialogue where every single character has like a snarky, witty line to say or some corny joke to make, um, especially in something like Ruby where it's clearly meant for, you know, a younger audience. As a huntsman, I've had my fair share of tussles. Like the mushroom? Those are truffles. Like the sprout? Those are Brussels. As someone who just picked up a random show to watch with no previous knowledge or context, I was sold on the characters, personally. I like Ruby as the bubbly, hyperactive protagonist. I like Weiss as an almost textbook Sundre. I like Yang as the half-party girl, half-doting older sister. And I like Blake as the... Uh, um... Uh, I, I also liked other characters like Nora, Pira, and Sun. It's all great. So I mean, I was hooked, but I'm not gonna act like I was hooked, hooked. Um, you know, like that new cyberpunk anime. Now that got me hooked, hooked, but uh, I was just too slow to make a video about it. But as for Ruby, it wasn't until volume three that I was really hooked like Patrick, cause you could say that that's where the larger overall plot starts to kick in. Oh my God, they turned on the NVIDIA RTX for this. Wow, so things are like happening now. So I'm not gonna lie, I wasn't really feeling that, that battle shown in tournament, but this is like mildly interesting. Mildly interesting. Mildly interesting. Mildly interesting. Oh! Hey! Hey! Whoa! Whoa! Oh my god! Mildly interesting. Basically, Volume 3 introduces us to the concept of maidens, who are these super powerful magical girls that pass on their powers whenever they die. The main villain of this arc, Cinder, has staged this elaborate plot to destroy Beacon Academy and steal the maiden's powers for her nefarious plans. This time, my nefarious plan will succeed! Very straightforward setup for a, a fantasy adventure plot, right? Mysterious prophetic powers, villains hidden in the shadows reveal themselves, an institution that was thought to be a secure stronghold for the heroes is destroyed. It was at this point watching that I realized that there was some real potential in this show because the transition from this... <laughs> to this... Felt pretty natural in my eyes. Yeah, the show took a drastic change in tone, but for me, it just seemed like the natural progression with the way things were going. But while volume three got me hooked, it was volume four that got me like, you know, you know, sitting up in my chair, like, and like reading wiki articles and, you know, looking up fan art and stuff. That's when you know you're in. I loved how they opened the world up and tried to be much more ambitious with the character stuff, which, you know, had varying degrees of success, but I respect the fact that they tried it. You gotta understand that I literally thought Ruby was a meme show that was just like watching an extended VFX and choreography reel. So the fact that the writers of the show decided to take Ruby even a little bit seriously was, you know, impressive to me. Basically, Volume 4 and parts of Volume 5 deal with the aftermath of the fall of Beacon in Season 3. It's a big, long Lord of the Rings style journey with Ruby plus what's left of Team Juniper where they spend the whole season walking to a place even though many forms of convenient transportation exist. Along the way, they deal with their personal traumas and get some of that sweet Sweet, sweet character development. However, the big overarching plot line of Volume 4 and Volume 5 deal with defending the relic and maiden powers held at Haven Academy, as well as finding out the truth um, about the main villain of the series, Salem, and her nefarious plans. Fasten your seatbelts, boys. It's gonna be a nefarious ride. These two volumes had some of my favorite scenes in the whole show, and my experience while watching it was like being an Asian parent who doesn't really approve of their child playing sports because they want them to focus on their education, but then I attend one of their basketball games out of support and realize, damn, maybe Ruby can actually hoop after all. 
What the fuck? I can't believe I actually care about what's happening right now. The slow parts didn't bother me at all, and I loved all the one-on-one -on -one moments, you know, Ren and Nora, Weiss and Yang, Blake and Sun. It was all great and showed that there could potentially be more to be done with this show than just, you know, insanely well-choreographed food fights. But after that, in like volume 6 and especially 7 and 8 is where the show started going a bit downhill for me. You know, not like deep nosedive off the King to Cod Six Flags, but more like going downhill on your driveway in Healy's. What? Somebody died? Oh, no. Uh, I liked most of Volume 6. The stuff in that farmhouse, I, I was cool on. And I was never into that whole silver eyes, uh, oh, Ruby is so fucking special. I was never really into that bit either. But most of Volume 6 was cool. I loved that lore episode talking about Oz and Salem. Uh, it reminded me of the Avatar and the Fire Lord episode from Avatar. I loved the whole multi-set piece fight scene at the end of the season with the Gurren Lagan mech and the Blake and Yang versus Devil May Cry Man fight. It all felt very reminiscent of the high octane fight scenes in the, in the earlier volumes and I was super on board for all of it. Even when they said this terrible line. She's not protecting me, Adam. And I'm not protecting her. We're protecting each other. Then we get to volume 7 and 8 and the whole like Atlas arc and it was like I was into it, but in the same way you're kind of into it when you take home a less than ideal lady from the club and it's like it's still good because you know but she ain't no Claire Huxtable. To me this is where Ruby hit the ceiling as far as ambition goes because you could tell that they were trying to set up this grand climax combining you know sweeping political metaphors with the main villain making a daring play and the heroes hitting their lowest points. Uh, again, like I said, some of it works, some of it doesn't. I guess that should really be the tagline for Ruby, huh? But anyway, that was a quick summary speed run of my experience watching the show. And like I already mentioned, I was pretty damn invested. And again, as a new fan who had no idea about the IRL lore behind the franchise, I just had to dig deep to see what the fandom was like. This is, of course, when I learned that the original creator of Ruby, Monty Ohm, passed away during the production of Volume 3, which was, again, unknown to me while watching the show. Looking back, they literally mention Monty and give him plenty of praise and respect in the credits and they have little in memoriam messages in rest uh, in episodes but i'm not gonna lie i don't be watching credits and shit so that all went over my head while i was watching now this is what really got me intrigued because if you don't know monty ohm's horribly unfortunate passing had the effect of splitting the ruby fandom in two between purists who think monty's vision was tainted after around volumes two and three and other fans who have embraced all eight volumes as a whole and who may even think that post time skip ruby is better than the first few volumes. Spend five minutes on the Ruby subreddit, or even worse, r slash Ruby critics, and you will see years of discourse about if Ruby fell off or not after Monty's passing, and you know, if the original vision of what Ruby was supposed to be was respected or not. All of these things that people don't like, oh, Bumblebee was forced, Cinder is a trash villain, everyone was character assassinated, season four is boring, Ruby is a Mary Sue, why don't we get more Zwei? It's an apocalyptic schism on par with like the Star Wars fandom. Cause you know, in Star Wars, you have original trilogy purists like me, people who like the prequels, people who like the sequels, and even people who like the weird expanded universe books where Luke Skywalker has a clone named Luke. It's a similar situation over with Ruby, you know, fans will drag the current writers like Carrie Shawcross and paint him like he's the fucking antichrist, while others will say that Ruby was trash until they updated the visuals in volume 4. It, it's truly a mess. But the drama goes even deeper. The sauce gets even spicier. The tea gets even more scalding. Because it was then that I learned about the now infamous open letter written by Shane Newville former lead animator of Ruby. If I remember, uh, I'll link it in the description, but otherwise it's a pretty easy Google. Uh, but the TLDR is that he left Rooster Teeth and brought up some very condemning accusations against some of the staff and how they were handling what he calls Monty Ohm's creation. The letter brings up things like content that was cut out of the final show and highlights the behind the scenes drama and production issues that came up. And he even insinuates things like Rooster Teeth gaslighting animators into working on a project that's no longer Monty's Ruby, essentially saying that it's a passionless project now. And as you can see through all the mudslinging,
slinging, it's Monty Ohm's name that is brought up the most and used as both spear and shield to attack and defend the show. People saying things like, oh, Monty would have never wanted this, or no, actually, this is what Monty would have wanted all along. And this goes for both Rooster Teeth employees and just random everyday fans. It's it's wild to, to consider how something like this can come to be because you watch the show Ruby and it's like, oh, this is a fun show. I could see this airing on Nickelodeon back in like 2009, even though it gets a little dark later on. It's a fun, epic ride through and through. Then you peel the curtain back behind the scenes and see the big fucking war zone. And it's like, oh Jesus. And you gotta like duck to avoid all the fans calling you homophobic for some reason. It's a mess. Uh, and it was, it was baffling me to the point where I had to look into the man himself to find out more. I checked out old Rooster Teeth interviews, uh, podcasts, and other stuff that he did to get a glimpse into who Monty Ohm was and by extension how Ruby came to be. And what I saw was a man who above all else had passion. Passion for fight choreography, passion for animation, passion for telling stories, passion for creating worlds, and of course passion for movies, video games, and anime. Ruby came to be because Monty Ohm and his friends wanted to create a cool anime. How could such a noble intention result in the fractured fanbase we know today? Why do all these people think that they know what this man would have wanted or wouldn't have wanted? For all you random people on the internet who say Monty Ohm would be rolling in his grave if he saw what Ruby turned into, one, that's a really disrespectful thing to insinuate about a deceased man you never knew, and two, you should really watch the behind the scenes of how Ruby got created. In my obsessive deep dive, I came across this video series made by Hypothon, which again, I hope I, I hope I remember to link it in the description because I'll basically be regurgitating the points that he made. The series is called What Was Monty Ohm's Vision for Ruby? And it aims to take an impartial look at the whole situation around the mess that this series has become. Now, I have no idea who Hypothon is or if he has any sort of credibility whatsoever, but I don't think that matters in this case because all the arguments he makes are based on publicly available clips and sources that are easily verifiable. I very, very, very strongly recommend that if you're a Ruby fan or if you're just interested in the behind the scenes drama, that you go watch this video series. One of his main points, I guess you could say his whole hypothesis, is that from the beginning, Ruby was a collaborative effort. Multiple people were involved, including Monty Ohm, Carrie Shawcross, Miles Luna, and even other artists, designers, and you know, even the voice actors themselves. Obviously, this all stemmed from the ideas that Monty Ohm came up with and the concepts that were swirling around in his head years before Ruby even began production. But it took a whole team to create Ruby, from fleshing out the script, to finalizing character designs, to figuring out character motivations. A lot of people don't realize that Monty Ohm meant for the concept of Ruby to be open-ended and subject to change or to be added onto. What he was referring to is how his creative process for Ruby involved balancing between planning many ideas out in advance while also leaving room for other ideas to be added or changed into the production when the time came for it. A large sum of concepts had been established into the show between Monty, Carrie, and Miles since before they started writing the script for Volume 1. Monty Ohm relied on his friends and team to put together the pieces and concepts that he threw at them. For example, the larger lore and world building, you know, the whole god of light, god of dark thing, you know, shit that wouldn't even show up until later seasons was thought up very early on by Miles with Monty's blessing. In fact, you could even make the argument that Monty's true vision of Ruby is just the red, white, yellow, and black trailers. Everything else is a, is a huge collaborative effort with many talented people involved. Hypothon's video basically looks at all these common and talking points fans of the series have and shows why there's more to it than meets the eye. Oh, they threw out Monty's scripts after he died, they don't care. Except Miles and Carrie actively fought to include fight sequences that Monty planned out. You know, for example, having the Yang versus Adam fight was something that Monty really wanted and said himself would be better if put off until a later season. They also cut actual character development fights from Volume 3 in favor of fights that Monty wanted, like the Neon fight, which, you know, is a good call if you ask me, because Neon is, like, best. Oh, Ruby was just supposed to be fun, goofy fight scenes. Monty wouldn't have wanted it to be this serious. Now, this one I personally kind of agree with, but at the same time, I have a hard time agreeing that that's what Monty would have wanted. Again, going back to that Hypothon video, I, for real though, go watch it. You can click off my video. I don't care. His is way better anyway. We can see that Monty and all all of the writers who created Ruby always envisioned it being bigger than what we see in the first few volumes. A big part of Monty's philosophy was that there's always more to these characters than what meets the eye at first. The line in front of the, the, the Yang trailer, uh, people are not one-sided, uh, people are not box-shaped, is to say that 
We do categorize people, but I also want to give people the chance to be more than what we expect of them. So you can expect a lot of growth for these characters as they grow into the characters. And you can see that Carrie and Miles have held true to that spirit, you know, given more depth and layers to characters like Yang, who was originally just the gung-ho party girl. Now, whether or not these developments were good is a whole nother conversation, but the point is you can't say that this isn't what Monty would have wanted. People need to understand that those who were left behind after Monty's death, like his co-workers, were probably the ones affected the most, you know, outside of his personal family and friends. So to assume that they're like anime supervillains rubbing their hands together gleefully tearing down Monty's creation now that he's gone is, is is kind of insulting to everyone involved. So I learned as I did this deep dive. I finally realized, oh, this is why things the way they are in the Ruby community. A beloved person, Monty Ohm, who had that original spark to create a world inspired by the things he loved, unfortunately passed away before his time. And now all eyes were on the people he left behind to not fuck up what he started. Of course, people are going to be upset because any changes made good or or bad are going to be scrutinized and held up to the standard of a man who is no longer around. I mentioned the Star Wars comparison before, but George Lucas is still around. We know what he thinks of modern Star Wars, and when Stan Lee was alive, we knew what he thought of the MCU. We don't know what Monty Ohm would have thought of current Ruby. And in my opinion, it's pointless and borderline disrespectful to speculate. But hey, that's enough of that heavy talk, because deep behind the scenes lore aside, what matters is what the average viewer experiences while watching the show, right? And here I am. Every Average viewer, I knew nothing, I watched the show, so now what? Uh, I mean, I like Ruby, I had a good time watching it. That's all. I know the common comparison people like to make is, you know, Avatar The Last Airbender, and yeah, that's true, but I think another good comparison is Game of Thrones. Hear me out, right? Both have eight seasons, uh, at least so far for Ruby. The first three seasons of both shows are well-received and generally loved by the fandom as the peak of their respective shows. Then seasons four and five received more mixed reviews. In Ruby, people were put off by things like uh, the long trip to Haven and all the weird stuff with Summer, and in Game of Thrones, people didn't like all that Dorne stuff. Then season six was considered a return to form for both shows. You had the, the great action sequences in uh, Volume 6 of Ruby and stuff like the Battle of the Bastards in Game of Thrones. Then seasons 7 and 8 of both shows experienced a sharp drop off and while Game of Thrones straight up fell off a cliff, it's up in the air as to where Ruby is going to go. Um, although there was a lot of falling off cliffs too. Both shows have grown beyond the control of their original creators. The Game of Thrones show has outpaced George R. R. Martin's books and become their own thing, and obviously we just talked about how Ruby was changed after Monty Ohm. But to me, the main thing to talk about is potential. At its peak, Game of Thrones was like the best show on TV and arguably one of the greatest fantasy shows of all time. Now. I am not going to sit here with a straight face and say into the camera that Ruby has potential to be one of the greatest fantasy shows of all time. I save those kind of delusions for other shows that I actually care about. But I will say that the potential for Ruby is there and you can see flashes of that potential all throughout the show. There's a great world with interesting lore, there's characters that are lovable and have so many directions that they can grow in, and there's a plot that, even though it's pretty bog standard fantasy, has potential to take turns that we don't expect. Like we can see that volume 9 is potentially going to be some lost in Narnia style type shit and it's like the sky is the limit really for where they can go but it's all about execution. It feels like episodes are too short and seasons are too short as well and if it feels like an over eager teenager having sex for the first time it's like boom 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 and then right when you think it's going to hit its peak oh shit it's over. Good thing there was a condom, right? Except Ruby doesn't have a condom. What? We just talked about how Monty Ohm himself said he left room for Ruby to grow and to go directions we wouldn't expect. So there's nothing holding it in as long as the people creating it still have some level of passion to finish it in a way that would make Monty proud. This is why I'm kind of glad I experienced Ruby the way I did because blasting through the series in a few days without having to wait between episodes, like weeks or so, improved the pacing for some of the slower parts of the seasons. Also going in blind removed all the bias and spoilers especially from the fandom. And watching it now in 2022 on the eve of volume 9 instead of following it for years since the beginning has helped me see it removed from the lens of this is how Ruby was and now this is how it is. Cause to me watching it all now it's, it's all just Ruby, you know, 
one big beautiful mess of a show. All right, well, uh, that's all I wanna say about Ruby. I was originally gonna make this one of those nitpicky videos pointing out all the holes, flaws, and like dumb writing things in the show. But remember, like I said, I didn't know what the fandom was like before this. So I didn't realize there were already like 400 videos just shitting on this show. So I was like, ah, oh, that's lame. Let me just look into the behind the scenes stuff and see if I can find out anything interesting there. And that's when I was like, oh, this is what I have to talk about. But yeah, thanks for watching. Even though I doubt anybody did, uh, I don't really think my subscribers would be interested in anything I'm saying here, but who knows? Maybe you found this in your recommendations, which in that case, please subscribe. I have a lot of other content I put out. Um, leave a like, uh, comment who your favorite Ruby character is. The only right answers are Weiss and Neo. All right, that's the video piece.